Some of America's most popular packaged foods and soft drinks contain ingredients so bad for you, they're actually banned in many other countries. In some cases, most other countries. For example, Mountain Dew. It's one of many soft drinks containing brominated vegetable oil. That's an oil that makes the dye stick to the liquid. It's also apparently made from the same chemical used to disinfect swimming pools. And it's linked to major organ damage. That's just one of the reasons it's banned in more than 100 countries. But here in the United States, it's FDA approved. Next, take foods with artificial food coloring. Pretty much everything, from Fruit Loops to mac and cheese. A certain dyes in the food cause diseases, including cancer in lab rats. Again, FDA approved, while banned in countries including France, Norway, to name just a couple. Fox News reached out to the companies for reaction to these claims. We haven't heard back from any of them yet. But the Food and Drug Administration, which approves these foods for our consumption, tells us it uses an extensive science-based process to evaluate the safety of food additives. I can't, uh, did he just say that? Yeah, a, a science-based process. Sci and, and just think, Harper wants our Food and Drug Administration to follow the same guidelines as they do in the U.S. So why do, you know, I, I always ask this question. Why don't we protect our citizens the same way? I'm Darren Howard. I'm Robert Nisbet. We're here to talk about Food Matters. It's video radio. Welcome to the show. Now, let's run this real quick right here. It's controversial, but Britain's Environment Secretary says that the public should embrace genetically modified food. It's a hard sell, though. Campaigners say it's dangerous to human health, whereas the scientific community supports the technology. And if it is as safe as they and the government are sure it is, then the argument for GM food is quite compelling. The US and Brazil are already massive producers of the stuff, and the British government says the UK shouldn't be getting left behind. Well, to talk more about this, I'm joined by Dr. Robert Verkek. He's the founder for the Alliance for Natural Health, which campaigns against GM foods. Why is the government so keen to develop this technology? Who would be benefiting from it if they did? Well, of course, there are about a half a dozen companies that are the key players in this area, of which Monsanto is the biggest. And they've been putting huge pressure on governments. And, of course, if you look at the concerns that, um, for example, the 400 scientists involved in the big UN study, ISTAT, that was released in 2008, that said GM has no role to play in feeding the uh, alleviating poverty in the developing world. Um, they're also saying that the biggest problem is concentrating the agricultural resource and particularly seed supply in the hands of a few companies. And these companies have a lot of sway with the major governments in the world, including the UK government. Dr. Verkek, many thanks for your comments. Well, as one environmental group said, the British government's attempt to get GM food back on the menu is like flogging a dead horse. And despite any of the scientific arguments for it, one thing that you can't argue with is that GM food just doesn't have a good reputation. A survey last month showed that only 21% of the UK population supports the technology. Polly Boyko, RT, London. It's really nice to hear a journalist doing her job. She asked him <laughs> who benefits from these policies that the government's trying to push. Now we've got GMO apples right here in the Okanagan Valley, our pristine valley. We've got wheat problems across the entire North American continent. And GMO pollen is getting blown all over in the high atmosphere, getting ready to rain down. It can hang up there for a couple of years, by the way. Yeah. And, of course, we can insulate ourselves against the weirdest, creepiest, strangest corporation to mount, a, you know, the entire human well, race. Well, you know, they brought us Agent Orange and uh, other useful things other like Other useful that. things yeah. like that, Napalm, DDT. You know. uh, same guys. I, I'm sorry. Maybe they didn't get involved with Napalm. I think it was a Dow Chemicals thing, though, wasn't it? It was I don't remember my history that well. Same creepy, short-haired guys. Uh, but, but however, there are solutions to these issues. And remember, we've got municipal sustainability coming up right here at Radio Free Canada in September. Uh, we've had to refine the program to accommodate a few investor-type people. But check this. Check it out. Yeah. What? They need to see this, too, the investors. Like most farms, work at Lufa Farms begins at dawn harvesting rows of vegetables. But this is no ordinary farm. There are no tractors, no manure, and it's a long way from Quebec's traditional farmland on the roof of an office building in Montreal. 
So we have uh, Boston lettuce that, that's going to be in all the baskets next week. And all of this is grown from a vision Mohammed Hage has been nurturing for years. Exactly. There are 40 different kinds of vegetables here, nourished by rainwater and grown without the use of chemical pesticides or herbicides. After banks rejected his idea, Hage turned to friends and family to raise the $2 million he needed to get the project off the ground. Now, with the help of technology like its automated greenhouse and an irrigation system that recirculates the water it uses, Lufa Farms has created a sustainable way to grow food in the city. Urban agriculture in general is really becoming an industry in and of itself, um, and we're, we're definitely at the forefront of that. We want to expand it worldwide. The produce grown here feeds more than 4,000 people a week year-round, and Lufa Farms is about to open a second greenhouse to feed thousands more. And that's just the beginning. Hage believes this is the future of farming. It is delicious. We're just starting. Uh, it's important for us not to initiate uh, this technology, this space, but to see through that it becomes an industry and to see through that cities like Montreal become self-sufficient with their food production. And we know we can do it. It will take time, money and innovation, but the hope is that rooftops like this one will one day dot the skylines of cities around the world. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. And basically they are going to have to go to urban farming because of what Safeway, Save on Foods is doing to us right now. Exactly. And, you know, there's also a commercial aspect to this, too, because you can sell the restaurants and grocery chains. Yes. And the big push right now in grocery stores is for good organic food. We do know that we do not require the oil industry and the pesticides that they push on us. And we need to start phasing it all out. These guys and in Montreal, that's awesome. Uh, 4,000 people a week. Okay, we've got one farm in Southern California that we're monitoring right now. It is seven acres, and I was wrong before. It feeds 200,000 people a month. Wow. Okay. That's this incredible. This is technology that's more than capable of happening, and we could do it right here in the Okanagan. Guess who's standing in the way of that, though? What do yeah. you got, brother? Well, you know, Chicago's falling apart, too, as far as their uh, yeah. urban decay goes. Yeah. But there are people who are trying to do something about it in Illinois as well. These plants grow up to live here, in an old warehouse that doesn't look like much from the outside, but inside it's a farm, a vertical farm of mega proportions. Five to six levels high depending on the system, and it's about 160 to 180 feet long. Each week workers sow seed after seed of basil, arugula, and other greens grown under fluorescent lights. The facility is part of a growing movement of indoor farming, but few have tried it at this scale. Some wonder if the sheer amount of energy it takes to run the lights over these plants is cost effective, but the owners say they'll eventually generate their own power with methane. They claim they'll be harvesting more than a million pounds of greens annually when the farm's final phase is completed next year some already being delivered to nearby stores in Chicago and its suburbs. The company's CEO calls it on-demand farming. Let's say the demand is suddenly for various types of arugula or various types of mixed greens or mini greens, we could change the whole system and uh, pretty much within the next uh, 14 to 28 days we have a full grown plant, whatever the market requires. And locally grown, increasingly a big selling point with consumers. Martha Irvin, Associated Press. So all those dinosaurs and fossils in the great big agricultural world still dumping pesticides in uh, this old school farming method? Ta -da! Yeah, I know. Let your medicine be your food. Let yes. your food be your medicine, right? And we're really talking about solutions like that. Coming up in September, we're going to have a major march against Monsanto right here in the Okanagan. People are getting together to organize that right now. You can contact us about that at Radio Free Canada. But you can also get on to major internet to talk about this. Oh, this is amazing. I mean, this is a local investor in British Columbia who saw a need and filled it. It just might be the healthiest and fastest growing vegetable garden in BC. It's certainly the largest garden of its type in all of North America. And as the organic vegetables and fruits grow, they are actually helping change and nurture the lives of the urban gardeners tending the crop. It's a downtown experiment, a paved two acre garden right in the center of a busy city. This is probably <laughs> one of the most dramatic contrasts. Yeah, we're looking at BC Place, and here's this uh, unbelievably intensive two-acre production right below BC Place. The Soul Foods Garden started from nothing in late April on a Concord Pacific development site. 
The company donated the land and gives any tax savings it gets back into the project. Van City provided loans, and Vancouver philanthropist Frank Justra donated close to half a million dollars to help grow better food and sustainable employment, the cornerstones of the garden's development plan. Many of the organic vegetables have already graced the tables of thousands of consumers and 20 restaurants across Vancouver. They're sold at six farmers' markets, with the profits going back to the farm to grow more crops and pay the wages of two dozen grateful farmers. The employees live just a few blocks from here in Canada's poorest postal code, the downtown east side. They have overcome challenges in their life and the job opportunities that until this urban garden came along have been so hard to find. This is the largest of five yeah. Vancouver Gardens Soul Foods has, but there's some natural magic happening at the Concord site. The pavement holds heat and helps the vegetables grow. The crop yield is 15 to 25 times that of a rural farm. The unique farm experiment second only to the positive difference it's made in so many lives. Now that's what I see when I talk about municipal sustainability. It can be done, and there's only a few people in real estate and a few people at the RDCO that are standing in the way of it, but they're the extreme minority, and we are the extreme majority. Yeah. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Please join us for the Municipal Sustainability Program right here at Radio Free Canada in September. We're open sourcing the solutions that we've been researching for about 12 months now, and it's all coming together in an awesome program. We've got some politics on our minds. Oh, we must bid adieu to a special figure, someone hey, who's very dear to our hearts. Very dear and dear to my heart personally because, hey, we're just here having some fun at Vic Tabe's expense. Doesn't he speak for the trees? Yes. <laughs> oh, That's terrible. Thanks for staying tuned. I am Darren Howard. Hi, I'm Robert. I, I think we man. already said that, but hey, stay tuned. We got more. 1971, when President Nixon took the United States off what was left of the gold standard, the world has operated under a system of money called fiat. The dollar, the pound, the euro are all government fiat currencies. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be so. It is the law that this government currency be money. Indeed, without that legal enforcement and the fact that we must pay taxes in this money, that dollar bill or that computer digit that represents a dollar would be pretty much meaningless. Only the government has the power to issue fiat money, but banks can create it through lending. If somebody wants to borrow $10, a bank can create it from nowhere and lend it. It can then charge interest. Banks also create money by lending against an asset, such as a house. They're given the deeds to the house and they create the money out of nowhere and lend it. Add interest, of course. But who benefits? Of course, those that have the power to issue money, governments and banks. They haven't had to do anything productive, they just create money. However money is created, be it through lending, fractional reserve banking, financial bailouts, or old-fashioned money printing. Banks are always at or near the top of the money-issuing pyramid. In reality, this process of creating money only redistributes wealth from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. And thus, that ever-increasing gulf between rich and poor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Canada used to have what is called a social safety net. That net used to consist of welfare and UI checks, and it ensured that people would not have to steal to live. But now there are no effective social safety nets left, except for the richest of the rich. How does it work? Well, it's pretty simple. Major corporations are awarded subsidies, tax breaks, and eased regulations, and you are not. Not convinced? Just remember that you pay 65% of your wages in taxes, and Canadian banks, corporations, pay no taxes at all. But things are changing. From Egypt to Toronto, from Victoria to Halifax, people are winning battles by standing up for what is right. People like me and you. On January 28th, we are asking you to go to your city hall at 12 noon all across the country. Spread this video around and stand up against corporate welfare 
and get our safe streets back in an effective way.